Um, so uh, what everybody I think, uh, I think understands uh, this day and age, uh, but if you do have a question of what we're saying or want uh, a translation, then please uh, just shout it out. Um, I'd like to welcome, introduce Victor Seward. Uh, we're so happy to have him, um, proud to have him, to have this show here, to be uh, the first ones that show his work in a solo, concise solo show like this outside his home country, uh, Great Britain, and, um, and London where you live. And uh, yes, this show came together very, very quickly, but includes work that you have been thinking uh, about for a very long time. So that was the only way that the show can come together quickly uh, of this extent. Um, if the thoughts are already in the head and you know what you're doing, um, but um, you have been making this type of work for a little while uh, since the uh, Royal College of Art, already maybe in the Royal College of Art. Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough uh, to be introduced to Victor. I liked his work very much. I saw it online. Only people know this today. You see, uh, you get across things, at least in the Corona days anyway, online. And, uh, but luckily I was also able to travel to London and visit him in the studio. And what I saw online matched the quality uh, even more, so it was amazing. The studio is full of little things. Um, and you're not quite sure where you should step, if it's real or not real, uh, that you see. And that's the same, and that's what we're seeing here too. Um, uh, it's, you're not quite sure uh, whether it's real uh, or, or fake. And um, I, I want to come back to this, uh, to, the, to what, you, so what you've been doing and the painting. Painting was such a big focus in your studies. Uh, you studied painting, but then and I, I see this, this grace and tonality, this, this the arrangements of painting in your work, uh, almost like in the Renaissance. Of course, the uh, theme Vanitas is something we're going to talk about later. Um, and, and that's uh, extraordinary to see. And I guess the first question would be how much um, painting is in these sculptures? Um, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for, for coming. I know it's such a lovely day, so thank you for, for being indoors and, and for coming to this. And um, yeah, in, in answer to your question, I, I studied painting at, um, at Royal College of Art. Um, everything there is split into quite sort of didactic sections. You've got sculpture, painting, print, etc. And um, I went in with uh, things which were already on the edge of what could be considered painting. and. Um, we had a really big year group. We were split between the traditional campus of Battersea and Kensington, which is where most of the design work happens. And there's lots of design courses at Royal College. And um, I just happened to be in that campus. I thought it was going to be a disaster. And then upstairs was, was metal work and also 3D printing departments. And um, I just ended up going up there and kind of falling in love with that materiality. And I ended up... Um, very early on for my work in progress show making um, kind of like a container, a vitrine, a kind of display unit um, out of metal and that's something that has uh, sort of pervaded my work ever since this is kind of idea of display and arrangement and um, you know I remember I used to walk around the sculpture studios and they think in a really spatial way everything is about how it fills the room and um, even though I did painting these are things on a wall it's a singular object and it kind of um, even though there were lots of people doing quite on canvas it kind of made sense for me to, to, to be in that department I have working on a kind of composition on the wall and even though these things are undeniably not painterly. I think lots of painters would take issue with saying that they are painterly. There are lots of painterly tropes in there. Um, this idea of composition, arrangement of form, um, light, tonality, um, all these things are considered when I'm making the work and when I'm arranging it, it almost feels like a kind of uh, a painterly manner. Um, the show came together very quickly, very last minute, and I'd spent a long time making these 
shelving units, these, um, I call them vitrines, because that's kind of how they act, even though they're not enclosed, they kind of function like a, a traditional vitrine, and um, I was freaking out. It was the last couple of nights before the work was being shipped to Zurich, and I was really freaking out, because I was like, I've not actually composed these things, and that's the hardest part, you know. I basically spent two or three weeks, best part of a month, stretching the canvas, as it were, and um, yeah, it was that last couple of nights, um, it all just came together um, um, kind of in one go. I laid them all out on the floor and then arranged things. And, um, you know, sometimes there's just a particular arrangement of forms that you know that's the right thing and it's difficult to define. And I guess that's like when people ask, when is a painting finished? You know, you just get this feeling of when something feels right and correct and you should stop. Kind of fiddling with it, and I think I got there pretty much with, with everything. There's a little bit of fiddling. Some um, of them have almost been finished here on site. Yeah, exactly. uh, just one or two. One or two. Most of them were basically. Um, Most of them, I knew what the arrangement was yeah. um, before they, they left the studio. But there were a couple, a couple, yeah, last final touches. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess we could talk a little bit later also about this. What you just mentioned, the color and the composition of color because it's very interesting in relationship to this type of work of how the color actually comes about because it's not really mixed as such but it is uh, printed um, and but you do take uh, great care of the colorations and, and it's very important how they appear and, and, and where uh, and, and yeah and, and in what setting they're uh, set in so the colors also of the shelves matter um, yeah, and, and the colours of the shelves, they are uh, powder coated, which is like a really industrial process. I think most of the things you see on the street are powder coated, so it has to be metal and they run an electric charge through it. And they run the opposite electric charge in the kind of paint particles, which they spray on and then they bake in an oven. And so my powder coater in uh, Tottenham in London, it's super industrial, they're normally doing stuff for the uh, for like London Underground and the Tube and they're doing handles and this kind of thing and I go in there and I'm spending ages trying to work out what colour and they don't really understand why I'm spending 45 minutes kind of trying to select the colours and they're really used to doing industrial things and mm. the, the colour gambit is this thing called RAL, R-A-L, which is kind of like Pantone but it's really reduced and that's what they use in the industrial sector. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting to think of the, the, the colour of the, the, the shelving is these are things that are designed for industrial use but then in this setting they're used for kind of a, a fine art use. I suppose I'm lucky that they don't do Pantone because then it would take me days to work out what to do. With Rao there's only sort of 50 combinations of colours so that makes the decision process a bit easier. Since we're already there, I wanted to have this actually later, but uh, you, maybe you should run us a little bit through um, how does color come about with uh, 3D uh, printing objects yeah. and also the technicality of this work. So just, uh, yeah, I don't want to give too much away uh, uh, that we want to uh, chat about a little bit later on, but um, the, there, you told me there are three different ways that you that these objects were made. Yeah, and there's 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 three different kinds of three uh, D printing in the show. I guess the most prominent is um, the the full color three D printing, which is um, printed uh, out of kind of like a, a gypsum based material, which um, you find in plaster or concrete, and it's inherently quite powdery. It's the kind of thing you add water to and it gets hard. And uh, the way that printer works is uh, it's kind of like an old school inkjet printer I used to have at home. And the coloured ink ends up curing the object layer by layer by layer. And um, those are taken from real world objects which are 3D scanned um, and then 3D printed in full colour. It's, um, I was boring some people earlier by saying this, but it's, it's kind of was, was used for, uh, it is used more for architectural purposes. Mm. Um, but it completely works in this kind of fine art, not necessarily fine art setting, but in this kind of idea of kind of trying to replicate a 
an object. It has to be, in, it's an inherently powdery end product. So the objects you have to use, you have to be clever with, with what you scan. So like robe or toilet roll, cigarette is inherently quite matte, it's not reflecting much mm -hmm. light, and that's the kind of thing that works. Well, that being said, it's really difficult to get the colour correct. Um, the guys that print it, they, they run loads of tests to try and fine-tune the machine, and we end up having to do about four or five tests to get the colour as closely matched as possible. Um, they're very kind, and they, 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 let me, they let me do that. Some of them are incredibly detailed. Um, the, if, if people haven't seen it, there is a little tiny fly over there. Um, and that was, um, I think, the success rate is 4 out of 10 or something like that. It's very low success rate. That's a, a different uh, printing method. That's um, called SLA resin. And the way that works is kind of like you have a, a pool of resin and you have a projector projecting each layer. And so things that emerge out of the bath upside down. So if you were printing the Eiffel Tower, it would come out sort of upside down. That's a really minute resolution. That's a one, one or two micron. Um, so I think each fly does take about a day to print. So it's coming out at super fine resolution. Uh, but even then, the, yeah, the success rate is very low on those. The legs have a tendency to snap off. Sometimes the, I have to paint the, the eye balls with a really fine brush with enamel and sometimes that just doesn't come out very well, so it's a very low success rate. Um, possibly the hardest thing to make in the show actually is the fly. But, um, yeah, and that, I guess that's a segue on to the other kind of printing, which is the resin printing, which is uh, kind of like the, the water bottle and the, the coral and the fly. And, um, yeah, that's an inherently more plasticky thing, so it, it, it lends itself to doing plasticky kind of objects like the crushed water bottle, or actually that Egyptian fragment is, is, is done in resin too. Um, and you can get very high quality, detailed prints. Mm. Um, people don't use it that often because it's, it's really expensive, it's, it's, it's hard to find someone that can do it for a fair price. Yeah. And, Normally you find like tiny little figurines done in mm -hmm. kind of resin printing as opposed to something a bit larger. But I've got um, a 3D printer who's an absolute hero and he, um, he, he gives me a good price. And um, you know, to be honest, like without the, the right kind of printers, this show wouldn't happen. They, they, um, I was saying to Fabian the other day that it's almost like a foundry. You know, artists will work on their clay maquette and then they send it to the foundry to be cast in bronze and it's kind of like that. So I have very close relationships with these people. Without whom, the show doesn't happen. You know, the colour would be off. I would be on yeah. the the prints and the the, the Ness, uh, That's the last kind of printing, which is called like FDM printing, which is uh, kind of cl classic three D printing. It's kind of like a hot glue gun that follows an axis, and you you have a a, a wire of plastic going into the machine, and it prints layer by layer, um, and I mean, those those nests are maybe a hundred hours of printing um, in the three parts, and um, the workload with that, when it comes back to me, is more because it's in three parts. It's having to fill and sand and add layers of epoxy resin and then paint, and um, so there's a lot of it's a labour and time. Technical. Yeah, it's it's a, yeah, it's a technical. It's very trend. labour intensive and very sophisticated uh, technology. I think what's the most interesting now um, to, uh, with, with that having said that, understanding how complex these works are created, what, what, how they're then composed into these works, and there are two main themes, um, I think, that, that uh, communicate uh, uh, an, an all-important theme that you want to maybe get across with these works, and that's one is the deep fake, uh, uh, side of things, the deep fake theme and the vanitas theme. And I think the vanitas theme, of course, uh, is this all important, eternally important um, subject matter um, from the Renaissance about life and death and transience. Um, and uh, you've, you've chosen this the formality, I guess, of, of the vanitas uh, theme. Um, and the memento mori, um, and uh, but for me these works take this almost the memento mori or the vanitas theme to the twenty first century because you are 
uh, you, you, you using your uh, uh, showing objects which might be sometimes random, might sometimes throw away things or mm -hmm. just completely mundane uh, things you may not pay attention uh, so much, uh, everyday things um, like uh, you know, or, or water bottles, like you said, cigarettes uh, over there. And um, in a way, it says a lot about our modern culture and um, takes this vanity theme into our modern uh, culture as such. And I, I'm interested, what um, is it about uh, elevating those objects to, mm -hmm. to kind of a pedestal? Um, and how, does, how do, you, do these uh, everyday objects matter to you in relation to the compositions? And um, uh, also in that, uh, if they are per se important to you, the, the simple ones, and, and, and what about the connotations they evoke, maybe like something like sustain, sustainability. I don't want to like yeah. drive you into this corner, yeah, but uh, if you you know you have these throwaway bottles, if you have all these, uh, this this there is a culture that comes uh, with these objects that I think evokes uh, provokes some thoughts in us. Yeah, uh, it, you know I remember just looking at Dutch Vanitas painting, and um, there are these tropes within the, with the or motifs within these paintings which are kind of trying to articulate the transience of life or like human touch so you have things like orange peel or bubbles there's a lot of bubbles because you know those are very transient and I, I, I guess the selection of objects in this show um, is I guess that they are uh, investigating transience of life to, to an extent but for me more kind of trace of human interaction so with the water bottle is more of that kind of crunch Mm. Uh, of the hand with the pistachio shells over there, it's more of a kind of, you know, the, the, the peeling of the, the pistachio and the, dis, the discarding the shell. Next to um, the pills. We've got some ibuprofen there, the um, and there are seashells, little things that you might pick up, trinkets, there's the cigarette bark next to the tennis ball, and um, ripped cardboard and, and toilet roll and folded socks. So these are all kind of like signifiers of of human touch and, 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 and interaction. They are undeniably throwaway things. Um, they are not things that have traditionally like high virtue ascribed to them. Things like socks, things like ramen, uh, packing peanuts, garlic, um, and you know, I'm, I, things like socks that, that in my, it, socks are so high ubiquitous, but they have like a really fascinating history. They're incredibly difficult to manufacture by hand. And there was a point in time they were reserved only for royalty. For hundreds of years, only royalty wore socks. Everybody else had their feet rotting in their, their leather shoes. And then through the industrialization, uh, the industrial revolution, there comes a point where suddenly socks become highly ubiquitous, throw away. And actually, all socks can be traced to a single city in China, which is called Sock City. And they produce, I think, four billion pairs of socks every year. So there's a high probability that all the socks we're wearing come from a single city. So I guess within all these objects are like these kinds of histories in, in, embedded within them. And um, the throw away, and I think that kind of adds to their, um, their success as kind of like a trump by object or something that might look like it's, it's, it's real because I think um, the fact has gone through this hyper technological manufacture is, is to an extent ridiculous, you know, like we, me and the printer spend like hours working out the colour and 3D scanning all this stuff and it's just a bit of rope, but I think ultimately due to the fact that it might not be an object that you would initially ascribe like high virtue to, that adds to the success of the illusion. Um, I, I, I don't know, I, find, I, I was speaking earlier about archetypes. These are all objects which um, are like, an arch they, they have the quintess quintessence of the thing that they are. The tennis ball, like I was looking ages for a tennis ball, and that was the one I found that in a car park. And, 
It had this beautiful patination to it, it had the Slazenger logo on it. Um, it was slightly dirty, that's like the one, the cigarette butt I was looking on the street for the, kind of the perfect one. Um, the pistachio shells, I bought a bag of pistachios and spent ages looking for the right one. So I am kind of trying to look for archetypes for the quintessence of things. And um, ultimately that leads into, I guess, the, 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 the agency of, of objects and whether or not objects can evoke something within us. Um, and I guess with these combinations of things that they, they, they kind of do, what that is, I'm, 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 I'm not necessarily sure. It's quite difficult. Um, you know, all these groupings of objects happen very quickly, and then, you know, it's only in the last couple of days I've been able to reflect upon them, and you can see them on the wall. And um, yeah, it's a hard question. Like, what, 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 what do they mean? But I guess it's easier to talk about the themes contained within them. I mean, some of the. Mm, the, the creation part of the objects is inevitably linked, I think, to to the medium as well, because you are making them so they're so well made, and you refer to them as deep fakes. Mm. And we know most of us know what deep fakes are. They are normally virtual. So what I what I find in, and and they are they are mostly to manipulate. Uh, someone, so they're inevitably political, the deep fake in a way, or social political in a way. Uh, and uh, I think this is you're you're flipping this one further by making a deep fake, which are always virtual, real in a way. And uh, I, I think this is this is an interesting um, evolution of of the deep fake and, and and what. So what I what. So, so, so the making of it is, is, is questioning us to, you know, what is real, uh, what is fake, and uh, I, I, I like how you are bringing this back to an all-important uh, theme that we know since, uh, since, or we're supposed to know since, uh, since a very long time ago. Uh, yeah, and, and the idea of deep fake is, um, I think I first heard about deep fakes a couple of years ago when it was a video of a, Obama, which had been digitally manipulated, mm -hmm. were using um, AI, and this AI is. But it was a comedian who did it, no? Yeah, and it's it's now it's getting like almost quite scary. It's really difficult to tell a deep fake apart from an actual video, and um, using AI technology, people are able to superimpose Obama saying different things, saying things which would be inflammatory. Um, and I guess in that side of things, the progress has been really quick. And I, I, I used to call these objects like tromploi, uh, but I think deepfake is, is, is more appropriate. And it is the translation of a physical object manifested in a different material just using binary numbers, zeros and ones. And it's, it's kind of interesting how you can translate an object um, quite convincingly into uh, like a simulacra. It, is, it, it, it looks like the thing, but it doesn't retain its actual essence. And yeah. I, I think, you know, from afar, the tennis ball looks pretty good, but then when you get up close, you can see little errors in it. And um, I guess there's the, the uncanny valley principle that you, you get close to it and suddenly it falls apart. And I find that quite interesting. That being said, this, this technology that I'm using is like, it, it's new, but it's, um, is widespread enough that I'm able to use it. Mm -hmm. And it kind of scares me uh, to think like how, how good these things are gonna be in, in a few years, because we've seen how deep fakes on uh, videos have progressed like incomprehensibly quick. I, the object has aspect of it is slightly lagging behind, but I, I, I think, you know, in, um, in a few years, the kind of uh, way we can manufacture objects this kind of vein of the, of the deep fake is going to be scary close to the actual essence of the thing. And, well, um, I, don't know, they, I don't want to get into it, and I'm sorry, but they make guns uh, with the 3D printing uh, by now. Right? You can 3D print the gun very easily. You can download the file and you can print it. It doesn't look like a, a gun gun, but it, it, you can load a bullet in it well, and fire it. You can download that really easily. Uh, a kid could print that on a home board 3D printer. And, um, you know, the internet and these kinds of things like love to be egalitarian and everybody can 
do these things and everything's open source and can download all this stuff. But then like when that comes comes to danger and um, yeah, I, I just wonder like these these objects look pretty good, but I wonder what, how that's going to look in five ten years and um, and whether or not these things are going to be indistinguishable and um, you know what that what that kind of that kind of means. And I think um, you know technological manufacture of things of objects somehow feels slightly behind the virtual world, but it is catching up very quickly and. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what do these things start looking like? And I guess this is a segue onto something else, or well, I don't even bring this up, but like um, that, that bowl over there is um, from the Texing shipwreck, uh, which was a, uh, a ship from 1830 from Texing, and it, uh, it was shipwrecked, and there were 30,000 pieces of porcelain which were underwater for, for, for decades, and then it was dredged up uh, by a German gentleman and it was all sold at Naga auctions and he proliferated the European market with it. Anyway, that's a Qing Dynasty bowl and um, it's yeah, a that's the real one. That's the real thing. It's still got the Naga auctions uh, sticker on the bottom so I know it's legit. But it's, um, yeah, it was a very quotidian bowl dating from uh, kind of about 1780, 1790 and it would have been potted by a person and it would have been used for every day, people would have been eating out of it. And then, you know, eventually it's, it's sunk and then it, uh, it's sold for an and then somehow finds its way to my studio because I buy it on eBay. But then what does it mean to place these hyper-technologically manufactured things within it? And um, could that craftsman have ever imagined the world we live in now with these kind of 3D printed shelves within there? And then that leads on to like, what happens to this work in 200 years, 300 years, 500 years? Does it survive? What does it, can we even comprehend that world? And that's what I'm also quite interested in, is it, the kind of the juxtaposition between things that are, are, are old and, and, and new. And that's, not, that's well, there's not many real world objects in the show, but the bird's nest is, is one of them. I got that from, again on eBay, from a gentleman in Estonia. Uh, it's a blackbird nest. and. Um, with 3D printed bird's nests, uh, bird eggs in, in, inside. And yeah, I'm not sure I know the answer to these questions. Like, what does it mean to juxtapose these things and, and what kind of questions do, do they raise? But I, I just like to imagine the guy potting the, the bowl and you know, you would have woken up on a normal day and he would have just potted it and you know, there's a Qing dynasty China and, and could he even, have, um, could they have even imagined this thing surviving that long in the world existed now. Maybe yeah. in 200 years there are no uh, oranges left, and then they find this orange and think that's how oranges were like. Yeah, <laughs> and they think, what on earth is, was this guy <laughs> doing? <laughs> what is all this stuff? Um, yeah, quite possibly. Yeah, okay. it's, it's interesting. To talk. Um, thank you, Victor, so much. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you want to, I didn't ask you if you want to take questions. If Questions. Yeah, I'm very, uh, very happy to answer any questions. I have two questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious what you did before you went to the Royal College, where you had access to all this machinery. That's one question. Yeah. And the other question is that is each piece you need to do a still life. So will you replicate that tennis ball in the still life? Is it really a one off minutes? Um, so, first question I, um, <laughs> I actually worked in an auction for, for five years for five years um, and um, I studied history of art as my BA. Um, uh, I uh, worked in an auction house in, in, in London and I spent a lot of time in the warehouse actually and um, I was most interested by like the antiquities and, and, and those kinds of things and um, you know auction is basically all about cataloguing objects and it's all it's so objecty and everybody is so hyper specialised in their specific fields and um, that's what I did for a few years after my History of Art BA uh, and then found myself at RCA Painting. Um, so I guess there's always been this kind of interest in cataloguing of objects, kind of collecting, curating things. But you um, painted then? I mean, you had paintings? Yeah, I, I, did, I did paint in my, in my free time. And what paintings were like? Uh, they were, I mean, they were paintings. I, mean, I, I did a little bit of kind of like work on canvas, but they were mainly kind of, I guess, wall hanging 
sculptures. The things that I got into RCA with were like these weird concrete casts that I made of things which I buried and then hung them on the wall. And so I've always been kind of a non-painter, but I guess it's always been something on the wall. Um, as to whether these are, I think the combinations are unique, um, but I mean there's two tennis balls in the show already. There's one behind Yulia and there's one over there. And I guess I kind of think of these things as, um, I guess, like a motif that a painter would use. Like there's, there's certain uh, motifs that painters always come back to. That's kind of how I think about these, these objects. That being said, like, I think they, I only like to use things maybe once or twice, um, nothing more than that. Um, but yeah, they, I kind of think of them as, as motifs which, are, which are, can be used now and again. And, yeah. yeah. Translating it through a process and, and coming out with a with, with a different outcome, but I guess that leads on to your second question, which is, um, you know, these things exist physically, but also the digital file is just as important as as the, the physically manifested thing. And these things exist digitally. Like I have the digital file with all the colour ascribed to it. Um, and that can all be achieved digitally, but that for me feels more like the archiving. Um, so all of these these objects, like I catalogue and I categorise on the computer, and they they all exist um, almost the same as how they do here, apart from here they're physically manifest. And um, I guess that leads on to this idea of kind of uh, cataloguing and, and future proofing. And frankly, the, those digital objects have more chance of surviving. Uh, in the future than these, these physical things, you know, like it, it comes to this idea of like, you know, how do you ever delete something from the internet and do these things ever like not exist once they're uploaded and all of these things are online and um, even though they're bespoke 3D scans which, which I've made, that that there's, it feels like they have uh, a much longer life digitally, but I always quite like the fact that anybody could choose to print them and, and make them physically, physical, physical things, and um, you know, it's difficult, it's, 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 it's hard to, the, the past month has been me kind of just getting the work done, and it's only now that I get to take a step back and really kind of unpack what is going on, and it's, it's really hard to define, and I, I'm not sure I necessarily have the answers to everything, and at the same time I find that, uh, like, that, that's, that's a good thing. I, I, I find when I make work which is like easy to describe or easy to kind of say what the conceptual underpinning to it is, then that doesn't necessarily 
lead to interesting work. When I'm a bit baffled by it, and, and I think that's a good thing, and, um, I am kind of baffled by a lot of these things and baffled by like what, what, what they're about. Um, but I wonder if that maybe means that it's, 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 it's more interesting work that I, I could make rather than something that I could just be talked about. Um, but yeah, good, good question. I'm not sure I have the, the right answer. Thank you. No, I mean, the complexity of the work is, I think, what makes it so intriguing and how to do Thank you so it much. Thank you. Open and, uh, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was brilliant. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.